Welcome to The Art of Conversation with Noelle McAlinden, a series of authentic conversations with fellow artists and creatives in unique arts and cultural settings. Today we reflect on our mental health and well-being during the Northern Ireland Mental Health and Arts Festival for 2021. I'm delighted to be revisiting friends that are currently based in the Northwest, artists who have committed and dedicated themselves to arts and culture for many years. We reflect together on the importance of our creativity and our self-expression and our mental health and how creativity, culture and the arts is something to be celebrated all year round. Morris, it's great to see you. I am, I am delighted to be here in the company of who I think an absolute genius, Morris, and I don't say that lightly, no, you know, no. and as a friend as well, and as somebody who's inspired me, I remember I first met you when I joined the Western Education Library Board, and I was taking on your role um, when you were moving on, um, having taught in, in um, St. Columns College, yes. and you, you'd been the advisor for the Western Board for a significant number of years. And I remember thinking, how was I going to cope with meeting with this genius and this She's giant? Tall. And honestly, I couldn't believe how humble, and you still are, I have to say, the most humble artist that I know. And yet we're beside your giants, these monumental sculptures that are known locally as the Tinnies, but their, their, their name, their, their formal name is the Let the Dance Begin. Let the Dance Begin. And isn't it ironic we are here in our third lockdown hopefully coming out of a pandemic. Hopefully coming out. And we see these musicians and dancers ready for action and I think we're all ready to dance and hug and That's right. perform. That's right. You know? That's right. So I suppose Morris, I wanted to ask first of all what inspired this particular piece of work. It's here now <coughs> just before uh, 2000. Well I thought that it, I, 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 to go back to our original th thoughts on it, it, it being on the border I wanted to make something that would be appeal to all people uh -huh. and I thought music appeals to all people, dance appeals and then this, the, the, music, the different musicians, the orange and the green, uh -huh. they both were given their place. Yes. So we have the guy playing the drum who is the, uh, the drummer of it and then the, the flute player of, of uh, the Irish tradition and what was the other one? The dancer, of course. Yes, the dancer. Uh huh. So the piece as well in the, um, in, as we enter into into Derry at the end of the Craigavon Bridge, that's known as the Hands Across the Divide. Yes. So how did that evolve? Well, it evolved. I, I, it came up. They, they, they came up and I had the paper for a, a sculpture, and they didn't tell me what what they wanted. They left it wide open to myself, and I thought it it just came to a, a vision of a the two men almost touched each other across the, the, the space uh -huh. and I, I began it, I began working and in fact my mother then helped me at the latter stages of the thing, she worked on the thing to put the clothes on and I mean I moulded from that. Isn't that fantastic? So your uh, mother had a part to play in that, the hand across the divide? Have. She did. And I suppose what, what were you trying to, to get across in, that, in, that, in, in, the, in those two very separate sculptures but were, were almost connected. What was your, what thought, was your reasoning? I thought that the, the, the space between us is so slight and you know for, 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 and to bridge the gulf would be take very little effort to do. Uh -huh. So I thought we could we can symbol, in a symbolic way convey that. Mm -hmm. So when was that piece of sculpture then installed? It was installed in 1991. 1991? It's a significant, a significant year, uh huh. And then that also then influenced the design of the Peace Bridge. Appar that's now in the apparently city. so. Apparently yes. so. I believe that the the the, the lines within the, the design of the Peace Bridge represent an embrace. Yes. You know, so that the, the, the two figures that you actually designed that were almost touching and almost holding yes. hands were actually embracing. Apparently so. And uh, I think we all look forward to an embrace and a hug at this at this stage, you know. But um. But who inspired you to, to get involved in the arts, Morris? Who who was your inspiration? Well, I went to St. Collins College and to the boys' school, and so at that time, we, no, there was no value whatsoever in art. Mm -hmm. 
I, I used to, I went to follow my accounts out of class. Uh -huh. And the old, in the old fashion type of education. But uh, I staggered on through it. Uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> I, I've, I, got, I got a couple of jobs from, uh, from it uh, in Muscommon. I became the art teacher. Yes. And during the 70s, I became, uh, I, I, I started part time in doing headstones of all things, uh -huh. in graveyards, yes. carving stone work. Uh, then uh, from that, uh, they, uh, I have lots of drawings actually of the year, of that time, uh -huh. and uh, the, ma making the making the headstones was a start for the thing, mm -hmm. and it went on and I continued with drawings until the the eighties really, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and then it, it opened up to the doing the, doing the, the sculptures then. Uh -huh. And you then made a the decision then to, to formally retire from teaching and to go into your your yes. creating your own artwork yes. full time. And I know that you have huge um, sculptures all over the island of Ireland. And, um, Apparently so. Yes, and I'm, I'm conscious to you have Narnia, the C.S. Lewis yes. celebration there in, in Belfast, and um, and also in Donegal. You know, so you have some very very powerful pieces that that are very much influenced by the community as well. They, well, they are. They are, and they are. They're popular works. They're popular images. Uh -huh. And drawn from popular imagination. Uh huh. Uh -huh. uh, but I, I, I'm not trying to confuse people in any way. I'm not trying to be obscure. Yes. I want the thing to be clear and cl very clear and what what it intends to be. Yes. Yes. So in that sense, it's they're obvious. Morris, we, we talked earlier as well about, um, and it's something that I know that both of us share an interest in, and that's about the importance of our creativity and our self-expression and our mental health and well-being. Absolutely. And how how, how do you? How do you keep yourself buoyant? What what sustains you as an artist? That's a good question. It's it, it's a sort of dream world. You you live in a kind of dream world, and and, and, and you find the, the the positive good thing to uh -huh. think about for every day. Yes. And every day it, it becomes the the issue, the thing to go for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like today, meeting yourself uh -huh. was a I thought I had to think about the thing uh -huh. before we met. And you have a gorgeous uh, love of music as well, and all the art forms yes. too. You know, you, you've mentioned before the sort of music that you like, particularly classical music. Yes. Uh huh. I love early music. Uh huh. I love poetry. Yes. Yes. So. And you've gone on as well to inspire lots of generations of artists. I know you've played a very important part for the the young and emerging artists um, that you know feel that they've been through the whole college experience. They've invested the time, and then they come out of college, and they feel that there's no place or space for them. And I know that's terrible that you thing. you have been championing know, that, that you know that that whole idea of having spaces for artists to exhibit that's in a terrible and studios. Absolutely, uh -huh. it's a sort of sterile situation for them. Yes, but it's it's wonderful when people are 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 there who can see see what they're worth, yes. see that they're trying hard uh -huh. to support the community. Uh huh. And I suppose this place here is just a, 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 a typical example of a space that is shared and celebrated and these sculptures are celebrated on, a, on all sorts of ways where the communities dress them up. Well it's wonderful that O'Neill's who, who dress them up, uh -huh. the factory the workers make the actual clothes for them. Yes, whether it's a football jersey or a medical. A medical, that's right, they had the, the National Health Service as yes. well celebrated and scrubs and they also had at Halloween it's a big big deal as well that's right. you know that's right so what are you working on at the minute I, I can't tell you really oh, I'm, okay I'm supposed to not say okay it. it's a secret. secret okay so we but won't we won't we won't disclose it but it's it's something good I hope it's something extremely good okay but I mean it's strictly under wraps okay okay so we look forward to see it to see the, is it the, a piece of sculpture it will sculpture. piece of sculpture a big piece uh-huh and it's at the end of the bridge. Okay. Of across the foil. Oh, brilliant. So you're back home again yes. with uh, a celebration and making your mark because on one side you have your um, uh, the hands across the divide, which, which are almost symbolic as well, not just of our political context and evolution, but also of our social state. How, how we, and and how we, are, must, we must find each other or else we're, 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 not, we're not complete unless we have come together. 
Morris, thank you so much. I could well, talk to you all day. Well, and um, You've 11 all <laughs> interviews, apparently, which is crazy. <laughs> thank you so, so much, Morris, and congratulations. Continued good health. I'm delighted that you are the recipient of the Ken Robinson Individual Unlocking Creativity Award. It's all down to you, I'm afraid. <laughs> thank you so much, Morris. Bye. Thanks a million. I just want to walk you home. So Jenny, it's great to be here. We're here in Little Acorns. You've just literally moved, well, fairly recently. Couple August last year, uh -huh. yeah. And I know you as a good friend, as a published author, mm -hmm. and as an entrepreneur, as well as a, a performance artist, and someone who continues to mentor and support those who are interested in publishing their work. Yeah. And I think you have really found your, your nest here. Yeah. I and mean, then you're here in, just off well, Foyle Street? Well, um, here in Foyle Street, yeah. Foyle Street, one of the main streets in Derry, just across from the Peace Bridge, beside the Guildhall, the bus station. And I just moved here last August, and this is now April. So I'm still kind of unpacking, but mm -hmm. I feel like this is, yeah, found my nest, found me home. Mm -hmm. Love, love those premises, love where I am. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's just great. Mm -hmm. So, I've moved five times, you see, so I think this is And how case. many years, Jenny? Well, it oh, would have been ten years open as a bookshop in March the 25th. Now, I didn't celebrate it, but I will hopefully in August when I'm a year mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. So, but when you think it was a hundred books on a wee table. And now that's I've, how it started? That's how I started. As a, and a why, why, did you decide, why did you decide to set up your own bookshop? Well, there's a little backstory to it because... Um, my background's working in the working with Guildhall Press publishers. Mm -hmm. um, I also worked in Bookworm Bookshop, which people would remember know that from Bishop well. Street. Yes, Shipkey Books and News, their sister shop in Keyside. Um, so, and I worked in Easons for four years, and uh, back to Guildhall Press. So, obviously, books are all part of it. But it was I'd moved house mm -hmm. into a smaller place. And a breakdown of a relationship, but that's mm -hmm. you're not there. Because you're on Pump Street, isn't that where you yeah. were living? Yes. Started in Great James's Street. Yes. Which down beside in Culture Land. And it was Bedlam were doing a weekend market, it just started up. So I had a little table full of just about a hundred books. And I had moved to a smaller flat, so I had no room for my books. So it was very hard. I had about six thousand books. There was more books than there was cups and saucers mm -hmm. and stuff. So started selling a few off and then I moved into a bigger space. And it was only at the weekends. And then us as Bedlam moved into the old Sisters of Mercy building mm -hmm. on Pump Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was about 13 of us in there with little corners. And I moved twice within that building. And then into an old shirt factory with three others. And that was called the Yellow Yard. And I was there for three years. And mm -hmm. just the shop grew again. And then into the old Britannia Hall um, in Society Street. Mm -hmm. And then now down, this building itself used to be, I think it used to be a tax office. And it was also a bank, but for language school have been here, people for profit have been here, um, the tech. So it's been lying empty for quite a while. So I just keep seem to be taking over and getting bigger. I've now four, forty thousand books from a hundred. So I I'm mean, trying to get rid of books, and now that's that's a lot amazing more. because it, this is not just a bookshop. This is a mm. this is a religion. It's a it's an experience. It's a performance space. It's just. You know, there's so many things and yeah. so many uh, stories behind the books and how you've got them. And I suppose this one in particular was always very, very interested in um, the Eve project. Yeah. And I know that we talked about the potential of revisiting this. Will mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit about this, Jenny? Well, the Eve project, that was published in 2006 mm -hmm. and funded by the Arts Council. And back in the day, back around that time, Arts Council was thriving. There was a lot of... Um, budgets and, and, and what would you say funding, funding possibly yeah. everything for so many different projects so that was actually started up guilt all press that's right and i'd come up with the idea wouldn't it be great to do an all an anthology of just all women mm -hmm. and not that it hadn't been done before but yes for the whole island of ireland mm -hmm. and we sort of thought and not just as a book do it as a multimedia so we i love that i love that concept with it and events and so i i sort of trying to convince a very much a male dominated industry yes and uh paul paul hipsley of guilt press was very open to it and we put a package together applied for funding and we got the funding for it but prior to that i had written to um i mean we didn't really do e emails were only really of course in. of course um so you were relying a lot on like phone calls and your local media mm -hmm. newspaper dairy journal radio for it 
to put out the call for, for submissions, but I had written to a lot of um, the top Irish authors, like Marion Keyes, Maeve mm -hmm. Benchy, mm -hmm. to sort of say, would you be interested in it? Or do you think it's a good idea? And it was amazing how many responded. And one of the most loveliest messages we got was I got a postcard from Maeve Benchy. Oh. Handwritten, and I thought, wow, isn't this, yes. this fabulous? So there's 55 women uh -huh. um, involved in this project, and we've got artworks, photography, drama scripts, um, Dance is represented, as you can see, with her mm -hmm. Lubia on the cover mm -hmm. from Echo Echo. Um, poetry, prose, um, and p some people had never been published before. Some are already established mm -hmm. writers, but all from the northwest of Ireland. And the youngest, I think, was 13, and the oldest was in her late 70s. And I'm holding one of, of Sue Divins' books. That's right, it's just been published. Book, yeah. And I'm so delighted to see it, Guard uh -huh. Your Heart. And I was reading the backstory behind it. And her, you, you know, her interest and her love of, of writing, you That's know, right. at an early age. It's a love story. Yes. Set, set in Derry and, and, and I, I, like two teenagers, male, female, Protestant, Catholic. Uh -huh. And they were born at the time of the, you know, the, the good f or the, the peace agreement. Yes. You know, so it's just about their trials and tribulations, but also very modern and set in modern times. And isn't it ironic because um, we were speaking to um, uh, Morris Harnan about yeah. his work and I mean, as a, as a, as a champion and a... A humble genius and, and yeah. how he's made his mark on the landscape but also in terms of the peace you know mm -hmm. and reclaiming space as well and celebrating it too and of course you've had schools you know this idea about oh, making yeah. literacy accessible mm -hmm. and this idea about you know encouraging a love of reading and the fact that it's a friend for life you know yeah. that if you can encourage and engage in reading that that is something that is a lifelong skill it is you and know one of the things i have noticed with all we've had a tough year mm -hmm. but it's what has been really beautiful is the fact that a lot of people are returning to books again. Mm -hmm. And whether it's, like I don't care in what, what way people read, whether it's on their Kindle, yes. on the screen, or in, 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 you know, in hard copy format, but a lot of folks are also sharing their reading experiences. Mm -hmm. So when I moved here, um, to this, I have a bigger children's area, uh -huh. and it's wonderful to see families coming in, grandparents coming in, kids engaging with the books because there's space. It's We're central, but we're away from the real world. Yes, It is complete escapism, but it also doesn't have to be a solitary mm -hmm. experience. And then people just chatting to each other from two mm -hmm. metres apart, of course. Of course. You know, but recommending books or, you know, and young folks, I must say the teenagers and all, um, and the ones college that had to come back, um, a lot of them have returned to reading classics, dystopian. Mm -hmm. So I've been changing a lot with the ways, it's the customers determine yes. or shape how I curate my bookshop. Yeah. In relation to your own publications, um, yeah. uh, you're a published uh, um, author and, and writer and you have Rain Spill there in front yeah. of you. I have a copy of that and was looking at it as well. Uh -huh. So what, what inspires you when you do make time? I know that's something that yeah. you have to look at again, but what, what inspires you? You're originally from Donegal. Think, well, language for a start, the language uh -huh. and, and the landscape. Yeah. Um, I mean, this collection, it was like came out in 2012 and then flicking back in it, okay, I cringe a little bit because it was all about relationships mm -hmm. and family, things that are still extremely important. Very important. But I kept really I'm being drawn back to the land, to the sea. And I'm from Minishone, mm -hmm. Greencastle. And your mother's from? The mom, my mum's from the waterside from uh -huh. there. My, my father would be my villain man. And uh, my mum was an English teacher and loved her reading. So I get my love of books and reading and all from my mother. And I, I think I get my... Um, from my from my dad said the chattiness or the yes the charm maybe you the know. charm and the oh, wit aye, yes. the hurry, you see you know uh -huh. charm the bees off the trees uh -huh. <laughs> but um, no I just think and I, it's, I love I think it's just the little tiny little intricacies I can't even say that probably the tiny little things that are so important mm -hmm. that you know I do believe everybody's a writer anybody mm -hmm. can write um, you know and it's just writing about what you know. Mm -hmm. um, I would never, and I write mostly in poetry, mm -hmm. um, I would find pr prose for me I, too hard maybe, because mm -hmm. I think they're all different disciplines, you know, but for, for me, people, I, I've noticed a change in what I'm reading mm -hmm. and what I do write down, so it, it's, it's a lot more to do with relationships, mm -hmm. humanity and people. Mm -hmm. Children fascinate me. Mm -hmm. I love that's one of the things I'd say I have greatly missed uh -huh. is the, the, the giggles and the, you know of the kids coming in and you engage with them uh -huh. and it's just the whole world is an imagination. Uh -huh. You know they don't judge you. They uh -huh. don't, you know that's 
for me. So maybe children's books. How have you sustained yourself during COVID? It's been a challenging time. It's been challenging. Um, mm -hmm. I think everybody's just been doing the best they can and there's no point being negative. It's been tough financially, mm -hmm. we'll be honest, and economically. But one thing I'll say, Derry has been a great, the community here have been great about keeping a lot of us small independents. Um, not forgetting us, not necessarily buying online, yes, but yes. ordering from us online. Yes. Or um, what I have been doing, uh, we were allowed to do delivery. I don't drive. So uh -huh. it's been hand delivery from the bus shelter outside. So, yes. It's like Sherlock Holmes coming out to meet uh -huh. uh -huh. And um, So that's been great. Like so, And it's great to see that folks are still reading. And that I couldn't, <laughs> a lot of people I couldn't recognise because we've got the masks on, the hats and coats. Mm -hmm. So And there's been people <laughs> waiting for buses when I'm going out there. So it's like... <laughs> I'm sort of standing there going, oh, is, is this the so person? So. And yes. they're waiting for the bus to go to Alton and Gals and I'm going, oh sorry, I thought you'd ordered a copy of uh -huh. Guard Your Heart by Sue Devon. You know, yes. so there's a lot of humour in it. Uh -huh. um, and I think if anything, you have to just mm -hmm. head strong, keep going, look at the funny side of things. But of course, on this serious yeah, and, side, and of course, we need the dark and the light. Like, oh, we need yeah. the dark and the light to grow yeah. and, and to, yeah. to express ourselves as well. And I suppose too, particularly as an artist and as a creative, um, Jenny, you know, our mental health is very, very important. Oh, it's yeah. a very fragile thing. Mm. And I think if you're any way creative, yeah. you feel that even more sometimes. I totally you agree. Know? Yeah. Uh -huh. I think if, for me, even I could have been at home not looking at, you know, not coming down to the bookshop. And I thought, no, come down here every day. The structure of it. I will meet the postman on the way down. Uh -huh. I'll meet the delivery guys, the bus man, the taxi man, the other workers in the street. And I think if anything, we've all kind of grown together as a unit. Yes. There's a lot of, you know, camaraderie and like support there too, because you go, no, we're all in the same boat. Yeah. But yeah. you know what? We'll get we'll get through this. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, like I'm thinking, a lot of people have found reading and writing, creative arts, absolutely very much. There's you know they're saving grace, their lifeline mm -hmm. during the lockdowns and during like being isolated from other folks. Mm -hmm. But with the online things, about well, being able to share their experiences too, people have become more open, which I think is lovely. And it's not before time. Yes, absolutely. You know, um, because we're all kind of on the same. Uh -huh. And it's healthy. Page to a certain it's a healthy to express ourselves oh as God, well. Yeah. And and yeah. I suppose that's the one thing that we can, with, through the arts, we can empathise with yes. the sadness and the yeah. losses and the gains, and of course the celebrations. Yeah. So Jenny, will you do us a, a, oh, okay. do us a, a, a real treat here if you can if you can read so, some? Of it. Twin Peaks. You were always better at numbers, at scrunching up potato crisps to not share, at charming your way out of trouble and always had better hair. Born of an Easter Sunday, for years we were dressed, me in pink, you in blue. Those colours matched birthday cakes until our 18th and 21st, where your half was iced like a pint glass, when mine remained rose-budded and schmoo. We shared First Communion and Confirmation, shared the donations and bought new shoes, and at National School had to sit beside each other when the rest of the class got to choose. You taught me how to catch tadpoles, score spiders into matchboxes and sail. You taught me how to play Monopoly, although you always sent me straight to jail. As teenagers, we'd matchmake our friends. We always knew who fancied who. The advantages of having a twin sibling, although you always had a later curfew. Now as adults, we're separated by city, furthered by status and truth. As adults, we don't see or talk much, and I yearn for the yarn of our youth. The blackberry picking and squabbling, the times you stuck up for me at school, Saturday nights out at scamps with our peers, and me always beating you at pool. I forgive you for joining my first teddy. I forgive you for telling me Santa wasn't true. I forgive you for throwing me in a cow pack. I forgive you for always wearing blue. I miss not seeing you as often. I miss how you used to be. I just want you to know, little brother, that you mean the world to me. the past it has passed for a reason don't throw it away nothing permanent lasts we all pass
pass with the seasons We're fading away Take the gift of the present And live for the moment That's all you can do For tomorrow Brilliant to see you. And you. Um, we're here in the craft village here in Derry, London Derry, legendary. So, um, so I, I know you not just as a, an artist and a performer and a singer songwriter, I also know you as a filmmaker. Yeah. I know you as an activist for mental health. I know you also as someone who is um, involved in education and you yeah. know committed to the whole area of creativity absolutely so I'm, yeah. I'm curious about your own story and how you got you know how you were encouraged or who yeah who was your mentor who was your teacher is that that you started off with well i mean i've i've always been interested in creativity and the creative arts and i don't see any one of them as a you know like a pigeonhole uh -huh. I, I do work across a lot of them as you say um i've often compared it to like a creative toolbox you know you're not surprised if someone can use a hammer and a screwdriver yes. it's just two different tools for two different things but um, I started out in school I suppose you know I had great teachers in school uh, Morris Harron who I know you were speaking yes. to was one of my first An art absolute. teachers in school uh -huh. and really opened my eyes I remember him drawing up, up on the, the board on one of my first days in first year you know took a pen and just drew an eye on the board I was hooked Mm -hmm. absolutely hooked I just was like I want to be able to do that mm -hmm. drew it in a split second and it was just gorgeous you know and Malachi McGonagall and a whole load of other great art teachers as, as I was going up as well as music teachers and just people that exposed me to the arts but I mean I suppose the biggest influence of all on all of us would be the, the family influence like yes, my of course. grandfather was James McCafferty the famous pianist and so we grew up surrounded by music music in the blood music in the family going to the, you know, the fish and singing and whatever else there, mm -hmm. there was going at the time. Um, and I was always very conflicted in school because I had to choose between art and music, you know, mm -hmm. the way the system set up. Mm -hmm. Big disagreement I've always had with it is that it makes you choose yes. art or music. And I figured I would always have the music in the family. Um, so I pursued the art route professionally and in my education, you know, and that led me to everything else that I ended up doing in the mm -hmm. in the creative arts and still do to this day. So. And of course you're stepped in education because you're also mm. one of the, the, the tutors in, in the Nerve Centre as yes. well. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. I teach the creative media course and film courses up at the Nerve Centre and, and they are very much of the same sort of ethos of linking the creative arts and Absolutely. seeing that you can use music and visuals and photography, film and animation and all these different disciplines together as, as a kind of a creative toolkit, you know. Mm -hmm. So I aim to teach people that, and we run those courses free of charge for people. They run all year long, October through to June, and they're, they're really well attended. It's open to anybody, 16 to 65, very inclusive education. You don't need any prior experience, all of that. So I have found that the fit with the Nerve Centre is really mm -hmm. in line with my own ethos yes. of yes. how creativity should be viewed uh -huh. and the benefits, the, the benefits for people's expressive creative arts, the, you know, their, their outlet that way and their mental health. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's just a brilliant set of tools. Yeah. And I know we were talking earlier as well, John, I know you've been passionate about the importance of creativity and mental health and well-being. Absolutely. And you've gone on to study further in that field. I have indeed, yeah. Yeah, what happened, it, what led me into that was um, I've always had a real, a real passion about using arts as a mental health vehicle. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, there's nothing selfish about it to say that it's, a, it's an expressive art form mm -hmm. that you can express yourself through and you put thoughts and feelings, things you might be going through into your art and use them to inform you. Like that's, that's sort of reason one I mm -hmm. got into that. But then in a professional capacity, I ended up making, uh, I was doing my master's degree and I ended up specialising in filmmaking and mm -hmm. mental health mm -hmm. that came off the back of the Six Strings and Stigma mental health album, which we wrote and recorded the song One Silver Line. So again, it's about all these little areas joining up. Mm -hmm. So we were invited to write this song inspired by real lived mental health experience. Mm -hmm. There was 12 of us that we all got together and wrote songs separately and recorded a charity album called Six Strings and Stigma. It's still available online. It's a mm -hmm. great album. Um, 
But then when I was doing my masters, I had the choice of kind of specialising in photography or filmmaking where I wanted to take the final project. Yes. And I, I took it in and made the final film drop, which featured in the Northern Ireland Mental Health Film Festival mm -hmm. previously. Uh, that did very well and it ended up, people were saying it, it was exploring issues that are very suited to film and, and they wanted to pick that apart a bit more. So I ended up, I've just finished my PhD now in filmmaking and mental health in cinematic arts. So thank you, thank you. And that, so that film drop, I watched it because you and I both are, it's, it's an area very close to my own heart, the whole yeah. area of suicide prevention. Absolutely. And, and particularly with young men as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. you know, this whole area of, I, I think sometimes, you know, we realise too, creative minds are sometimes, you know, very, very, I suppose, sensitive too in terms of picking up, you know, Absolutely. feelings and emotions. Absolutely. And I think one thing that the, that the lockdown and COVID has taught me is that our own creativity and self-expression is even more important now, you know. Totally. And and I, I mentioned before that we d we do need the dark and the light to shine and, and to grow as yeah. well. And certainly as a, as a source for our own creativity, yeah. whether it's music yeah. or the visual arts or any of the art forms that you talk about, mm -hmm. you know, that that whole area of um, mining deep and digging deep is very, very important, yeah. you know? It, it comes with the territory, and I mean, it's a, it's a cliche, the tor tortured artist thing and all that. We don't want to go there, but yeah. but there's certainly a lot of truth in that, that you yes. are exploring the light and the dark, and uh -huh. in, in songwriting, you're writing about things that are, that are, you know, impactful to you and the other people close to you and things that maybe people have gone through, but you're trying to put them in such a way that other people can relate to them. It's not just biographical truth yes. of this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Yes. It's kind of making a, a universal thing that people can relate to and find their own truth. Yes. Find it relating to them. Yes. Um, and again, like the final film for the PhD was called Jack and it was taking the template of what Drop did and using research and using the latest research in multiple fields related to mental health and suicide prevention, including psychology, philosophy and so on and feeding them into mm -hmm. a final film outcome. Mm -hmm. But the film itself, it uses, you know, it uses motion, it uses light, it uses framing, and it, it uses music. It's like a perfect it's an art medium form. To, yeah. to combine uh, all the things yes. that you're interested in. And Matt, in, you your know? brother, uh, featured in Matt, that? Matt, my brother, was yes. the protagonist of it. Uh -huh. He's also in the band with me and all of that. Funny story, Matt actually helped produce because I, I'm not from an acting background. Mm -hmm. Matt is a vastly experienced actor. He's been in everything. He's been acting 25 years since school time. He's been in plays and everything else and uh, featured in Game of Thrones quite prominently in the last season. You know, he's got, still got it as a profile pick and amongst the whole cast. Uh -huh. you know, brilliant uh -huh. stuff. But I got him on board for the first film during the Masters and I, I just wanted him on as someone who had professional experience working in the acting world during rehearsals and so on saying look mm -hmm. you might know what to look out for even yes. more than I would. Yes. So we worked together on that, he was behind the scenes on it and then when we were doing the auditions for Jack uh, for the PhD he, he was helping with all of that and he was adding suggestions of how Jack might speak and how he mm -hmm. might go about this. Mm -hmm. And would he say that or would he rather do this and offering mm -hmm. all these great suggestions? And I was like, you should be doing Jack. And it became really obvious when he was doing it. So he, he ended up playing uh -huh. the lead role and he was brilliant. It was it. brilliant and it was absolutely brilliant. brilliant. And, and, and it's the sort of thing that could be used as an education tool. Like I'm thinking about schools and, and colleges and all of that and, and in the workplace as well, because mental health is really, really important. Yeah. And I suppose the other aspect as well too is, and I'm thinking too, because one of your, your tracks is Jack all work no play? All work no play. You know, and was that why you chose yeah. the name Jack? Or maybe, that, maybe, maybe. Yeah. We were trying to f think of a, I suppose, a generic enough name, but it, it might have had a link subconsciously to like Jack Nicholson, maybe. Yes. But, yes. The, but that again is Jack the all work no the, play. That's, yeah. So it probably did link from writing uh -huh. about it in that song, I suppose, through the thinking of that type of a character. And it was funny, I was listening to um, Niall Breslin, Brezzy came up and he did a talk at the Mental Health Film Festival, uh, or Mental Health Festival rather, yes. up in McGee, uh -huh. while I was there. And he was talking about his book, Me and My Mate Jeffrey, right? And I was like, surely not. This uh -huh. is two years into my PhD. I've developed this whole idea of Jack being the the mentally, mentally unwell uh, sort of side of yourself and being able to catch Jack when he's 
playing a part in, uh -huh. in how you're thinking and how you're acting the yeah. others and so on. Um, that all stemmed for me from Eckhart Tolle and the egoic mind and yes. the power of now and yes. the new earth. Yes. That came directly from that for me saying, well, I need to name this mm -hmm. thing, this person. Mm -hmm. And Jack just seemed like a natural fit. And Brezzy was up doing his talk and he talked about his book, Me and My Mate Jeffrey. And I was just like, no way. Unbelievable. And he's talking about exactly the same thing. I had no knowledge even of the guy before at all, to be honest. At this stage, this is maybe four or five years ago. Yes. Um, and when he was talking, I was just like, oh my God, that's that's what Jack mm -hmm. is. That's exactly it. So there's a, a certain truth in that, that people are arriving at this kind of representation of it yes. separately, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's what he does. That's what I do. That's what I'm hoping Jack delivers the message for is, uh -huh. is learn to recognize that those thoughts, behaviors, actions, and so on, aren't you, they aren't the underlying yeah. human underneath it all, yeah. you know, they're just and they're feelings. Not, and they're not with you all of the time, exactly, you know, every day. Exactly, It's interesting exactly. too, uh, John, what you were talking about too, because what, what comes across in both your music and your lyrics, <clears throat> and also in the work that you've done to date and continue to do, is this, this idea of being intuitive and also being very, very empathetic as well mm. you know and there is a difference between empathy and sympathy as oh, we absolutely. know but absolutely. this idea of as you said catching yourself or catching other people and i suppose that's one of the one of the many benefits of the arts and and, and the creative arts in the in in, in the widest sense is that it, it articulates in a language that people can understand totally and can identify with totally almost the unsaid can be can become you know visible and verbal because of what what you express and um Absolutely. have you a particular uh, track or song that you you um that you have that that is your kind of um anthem if you like Do, uh, <laughs> it's funny um yeah i think i suppose it probably because i was working in this this kind of line um the last album, Nothing Permanent Lasts, yes. like that, that as the title track is about the impermanence of all things. I was listening you know, to that on the way up in the car yeah, and, the, the, and the words are very powerful. Yeah, uh -huh. it's, it's like, it's about that thing of no matter what you're going through, it, it will pass and nothing, per, not, nothing that we see as permanent lasts. Yes. And I started kind of pulling at that thread and it just went on and on. But a tattoo is permanent. No, it's not because in a hundred years time, yeah. There's no more tattoo, yeah. you know, and and it just went out and out on that, and that all came from like it's it's the word. I think I might be the first person possibly ever to use the word stromatolite in a uh -huh. in a song. <laughs> <laughs> I, I went looking and mean? I couldn't what find any other. They're little living rocks on the west coast of Australia, right? And when we were out in Australia, we went to visit them and. These are just, they're the most unassuming little things, right? A little bed, like the Giant's Causeway is yes. infinitely more impressive yes. than the yes. Stromatolites. They're yes. just little rocks in a rock pool. Yeah. But they are actually the origins of all living life on Earth. They were the first ever things to oxygenate the atmosphere. Yes. And yes. so everything that we know as life now came from these things, just wee stones out in the ocean. And that was, you know, they're billions of years old and they did this huge big arm span thing where it's like, you know, here's the start and here's the stromatolites and then way up here at a fingertip is humanity, you know. So uh -huh. it was just a very, uh, it, it totally altered my perspective on time mm -hmm. and our place within it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and well, a sense it's of scale. And Absolutely. a sense of scale because Absolutely. you can still make a huge difference whether, you know, the scale of, you know, of of your impact on this world or in this life yeah. is nothing to do with your size or, or your power. It's actually to do with simple acts of kindness sometimes You're as well you know right. and that idea absolutely of oxygenating right. yeah. and and the ripple effect as well and i have no doubt john the work that you do the music that you that you use to lift and to inspire and also the films that you've made have yeah. been an excellent yeah. already an excellent yeah. tool and um, your next album is due it's it's, it's very due. much due it uh -huh. absolutely is we got um we got knocked back as everybody did with covid there but mm -hmm. uh, ourselves particularly like uh we, we were due to celebrate our 10 year anniversary as a band because yes. you'll remember you and I met you, yes, in 2010. Yes, and you launched your, your album in the City yeah, of Culture office. That's right, yep. that's right. So when City of Culture was announced in 2010, couldn't have been more perfectly timed. Mm -hmm. I had previously been a solo artist doing my own music, I had my own uh -huh. albums out for the, the 10 years before that, but uh -huh. we'd come back, we'd formed the band, we'd gone out to France to record the album and we had just returned just as City of Culture was announced. Mm -hmm. And so there were conversations about who's doing what, and we were like, well, mm -hmm. I think it was Dennis McLaughlin said, John and the boys have just been back mm -hmm. there. And 
So we ended up launching the album in the City of Culture office. I, I Three remember Three years it. later, the, cult, uh -huh. you know, the year of culture and stuff. So it's been an amazing journey. But we were due last year to celebrate 10 years of uh -huh. that. So we were back in the studio. We were writing. We were kind of building up to that, to do a tour and all of that. But yes. all that was scuppered. So, I, you know, not going to lie, that took the wind out of the sails. I'm sure. For, for last I'm year, sure. it was real, you know, it was a, a, a real knockback. But that's not unique. Uh -huh. The whole world was knocked back yeah. last year. Um, but I'm glad to say this year's off to a much more positive start mm -hmm. for us. We're, we're due to, on the 1st of May at 8 o'clock, we're due to do the, our first live stream from the Nerve Centre. Uh -huh. Since COVID, first time back playing as a band, we, we recorded it there and it's gone out on the 1st of May at 8 o'clock. So. And I couldn't help but think, you know, when we were speaking to Morris and about the Let the Dance Begin, you know, his yes, iconic course, sculptures yeah. just outside the band. Mm -hmm. And we're all just waiting for the that. Tunnies. You know, we're just waiting for the dance to begin. Oh my the God. music to start. Too right. And John, I can't I can't tell you how, how lovely it is to get talking to you and looking so forward to hearing you um, live um, and looking forward to the gig in May. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Where the seconds and hours we assume to be ours Are not sand dunes, just grains of Nothing permanent lasts, that's what they'll all say Long after the bones of the hills have faded See you. Um, lovely to see you here in Derry, London Derry, legendary. Um, and we're here at Ebrington and we have a fantastic view of the of the city here behind us. And just we couldn't get a better day. I know it's a beautiful day. Isn't it gorgeous? Yeah, you know, this will this will be summer this year. It will be, it will be. And Frank, I know we're coming to the end. What I hope is the third lockdown. And you were saying earlier that you are very much at home in this place. You're here 22 years? Um, it's surprising to me, you know, that I, I moved here to the end of 1998, so yeah. Uh -huh. I've been here a long, long time, uh -huh. much longer than I suspected I would be when I yes. arrived. Yeah. And of course, um, I know you with several hats on, Frank. I know you as a performance artist and a poet and a writer, and also I know that you're involved in many arts and cultural organisations. Normally run a couple of spoken word nights and other events. As you say, we know each other through various uh -huh. festivals, such as Flive down in Fermanagh. Uh, through Bluebell Arts, we deliver a wide range of creative community arts projects to the community. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with the pandemic, a lot of that has had to shift online, uh -huh. which has been a whole learning process for myself and yes. many other people. And it's, uh -huh. So, it's, it's it's been challenging, but it's been very interesting as uh -huh. well. So Frank, this this um, lockdown has brought challenges as well as opportunities. We were talking earlier about online learning and, you know, you were saying about new skills that you've you've learned yourself. Yeah, well, but, but before the lockdown started, you know, I had very little experience with a lot of different kinds of software, but I'm slowly getting more adept with film and editing software which has been a necessity because a lot of the stuff that a lot of the workshops that we would normally be providing for people as live mm -hmm. you know, they'd be in the room learning mm -hmm. haven't been possible so mm -hmm. we've had to deliver a wide variety of video workshops and quite a bit of that has involved editing same with some of our spoken word events well, there's one called Speakeasy, which is now an online event, which consists of pre-recorded bits and pieces uh -huh. that people send in, and I edit it and put it all together and uh -huh. try and do one every month. And you've created international audiences as well, Frank, well, I've noticed. That's, that's been the interesting thing about the lockdown. A lot of the things that I would have done as an individual artist and as a provider of community arts yes. workshops, 
would have been more local, more focused in the Northwest or Northern Ireland even, uh -huh. or even the island. But since we've put a lot of stuff online, there's been a lot of connections made, interestingly enough, particularly with where I'm from originally in Absolutely. Glasgow. Absolutely. I noticed I've, that. I've, connect, yes. I've reconnected with a lot of artists and performers uh -huh. that I hadn't been in touch with a couple of years ago. Uh -huh. But I've also had people from Germany and America getting in touch with us and providing some contributions to mm -hmm. some of our online work. That's also the same with some of the online art exhibitions yes. that Bluebell Arts has yes. put together. I noticed that, uh, that you, what you've done as well, you've managed to reach out to a whole range of different um, audiences and art forms as well, which is which is the beauty about the arts, I suppose, and about being creative and encouraging people to be creative. Yeah, well, I mean, my own thing is spoken word, poetry, creative writing, uh -huh. but through my workplace with Bluebell, our provision is visual arts, all kinds of arts and crafts. Uh -huh. One of the great things during the, the lockdown, I'm not saying great, because it's bad in some ways, but uh -huh. one of the groups that we would work with is called Keeper Knit, which yes. is knitters and crocheters. Margaret, yes, I know Margaret and well. Uh -huh. Through that, because they weren't able to be in the building, we provided some funding and coming up for Christmas they d made a project called Angels Amongst Us and we had an agreement with Foilside so we hung all the work, all the angels that the women created around the big Christmas tree in Foilside uh -huh. in the run up to Christmas then there was the other lockdown That's right. so not as many people as we hoped got to see that yes. the original plan was that that was going to be on the one show on BBC yes. One but that didn't happen but they came back to us for the Easter one yes. which was Easter bunnies and I'd... various other things, all knitted by uh -huh. local women. Absolutely. And, and several of them got in touch with us and spoke to us personally to let us know that during the lockdown, being able to do that and have their work seen by so many people Absolutely. Uh, has been a godsend to uh -huh. them. And, and Frank, how have you nurtured and nourished yourself during this time? It has been challenging for artists and performers. How have you, how have you managed it? See, what, what, one, one of the wildest things about it has been this online connectivity. Uh -huh. You know, I've, I've delivered workshops for people online, you know, whether it's art classes uh -huh. or whether it's creative writing classes with various groups. But as an individual, I mean, recently I've been doing sounds, I've been doing words for soundscapes created by musicians in Glasgow some of whom I've known for many years, but yes. haven't, we haven't actually worked closely together before. We've been on the same gigs in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also doing some words for, believe it or not, uh, a couple of dance tracks by a local DJ. Brilliant. <laughs> just, Brilliant. <laughs> stuff that you just wouldn't have thought would happen. Uh -huh. But people are starting to connect across a, a whole range of disciplines. And of course, and music music is your passion. And you, you the first lockdown, you, you set up this dancing at eight yes. to encourage people to dance to music of their choice. Yeah, yeah I mean, you, the, you... The, the idea was, you know, sure, we're all locked in our uh -huh. houses for the, for the next while. And particularly myself, I was told to stay at home for the first three months of it. Uh -huh. But the Dancing at Eight project was just a Facebook group and 600 odd people uh -huh. joined it. The idea was people shared music videos and the other side of it was people were meant to film themselves dancing yes. as well, but very few people yes. did that. A few I, I, did. I, yes. thoroughly, I have to say, yes. I thoroughly be, enjoy being part of it. Frank, um, I could talk to you for ages and I'm, I'm very conscious. I, I, I know that you're going to uh, uh, perform one of your own pieces uh, yeah. and we, we're looking forward to that and I just want to say Frank thank you very very much and continue to uh, perform continue to do the great work that you're doing and continue to inspire thank you so this is the poem your health my grandparents could barely breathe from tightening their belts is it so hard to imagine now the terror that they felt. 
each time that they or one of theirs was sick or taken ill? Could they afford the medicine, the two pound doctor's bill? Yet each and every time today, when families are unwell, health care is free for her, for me. Now there's a tale to tell. You grant me the serenity, which they had never known. From their collective will, you sprang, completely ours, homegrown. My dad's sister, Patricia, she was the aunt I'd never meet. Back then, pneumonia would often bring a funeral to a street. But no magic spell could summon you. You are our own creation. You were demanded, and out you came from post-war devastation. You embody love for everyone, and still we understate your true value and your worth to us since 1948. You grant me the serenity that those before me had not known. From their collective will, you sprang, completely ours, homegrown. If and when we can, we pay, so that if and when there's need, by her, by me, by neighbours, strangers, friends, you intercede with doctors, nurses, hospitals, new treatments for our pain. You act as salve and balm if we are wounded or insane. We'll never know because of you the fear people once felt. Poor people who could barely breathe from tightening their belts. You grant me that serenity which they had never known. From their collective will, you sprang, completely ours, homegrown. It is just a joy to be here today and thank you for making time for us. Um, I know you over 15 years and I know you as a, a, an author, a respected author and a broadcaster and, and a writer and also in your, your production of, of theatre. Mm -hmm. But I had no idea that you had th these many publications to your credit. Well, I finished a commission during the last bit of lockdown there, which was really helping to ghostwrite uh, a biography for a survivor of the conflict. And I think that'll take me, it'll be out later this year, and I think that takes me to 24 mm -hmm. titles, mm -hmm. published titles of varying length and genre. Uh -huh. But I suppose, yes, when you look at it, you think it has been a busy time. Uh -huh. And we were talking earlier, you're originally from Armagh, I am. Armagh, and so am I. Armagh. So you're South Armagh, I'm from... Mahari, a wee village in the shores of Loch Ness. I'm from Darkley on the border. Uh huh. And you are here now in, in this, in the dairy, how long? Oh, 35 years. And you obviously love it? Oh, I think it's home now. Uh huh. It's very uh -huh. much. I have big connections here now. It's such a thriving arts community. Absolutely. And while I'm still a blue and my daughter was born and raised here, so she's a, she's a dairy girl. Uh -huh. So there's uh -huh. that connection too. Yes. And I mean, I had the privilege of working with you and, and Ollie and many of the artists and creatives here during the whole City of Culture, you know, the, the, yeah. the lead into that and the bid, but also over the years as well with the education field as well. And just talk us through, you know, the, 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 some of these beautiful um, publications. You mentioned earlier you had been with the BBC. I had, yes. I was 20 years with the BBC, starting as a researcher on Spotlight, which is still going. Uh -huh. And then I was there at the time of the hunger strike when they were recruiting, recruiting a lot of young, as we were then, yes. reporters from the different regions to work alongside their national reporters because they had the expertise and we had the local knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I went straight into the newsroom then and 
didn't leave newsrooms for the next 19 years. And it's funny because as we emerge, hopefully out of the third lockdown, when you look at how many people have learned and relearned, you know, their own, you know, developing their own skills in terms of the use of, of IT and the use of online publishing and all of that. Oh, very much so. You know, it's, 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 it's the, ch the, the pace of change is hu has been huge. It has. You know. People who were saying a year ago, I don't do Zoom. Uh -huh. I'm using it every day now. Yes. I would be one of those who, who is now teaching others and that is hilarious you know as someone now who is is uh, has now changed now to become a wee, a little bit more of a, a digital native you know mm -hmm. and so many people are writing yes well you you were saying that earlier i mean how how have you or have you been inspired or nurtured during lockdown how, how have you felt this time as somebody who normally has a fertile mind and is obviously involved in so many creative things. I think the biggest loss to me was because I've been working very much in theatre with the Playhouse uh -huh. and that stopped dead. We were on the verge of doing a tour, we were on the verge of being trained up to do facilitation and that just had to stop. And what, was the, what was the resume. piece? That was with the First Responders Project which was one of the most exciting things I've done recently. It was a development really from Theatre of Witness yes. and it was bringing together people who were seen as first responders during the worst of the conflict. People mm -hmm. who worked in different areas, police officers, paramedics, nurses, a journalist, that was mm -hmm. me, and a camera operator. And it was looking back at our experiences and how they maybe shaped us over the years. Mm -hmm. And what made it really special was we worked amongst ourselves, first of all, but then we worked alongside a, t a youth team who were drama students, mostly in the 19 to 21 age group, mm -hmm. whose parents, or maybe even grandparents, had grown up through the conflict. And it was a mystery to them. It had become very much something that wasn't talked about, mm -hmm. but they wanted to know about. And they were so refreshing because they challenged us on so many of our prejudices and our legacies and they opened our eyes to the challenges that are facing a new generation. Mm -hmm. Maybe too, they respected a lot for what we had gone through. And the wisdom, obviously. Their ages. And yeah. we, I think all of us were trying to get the message through that this could happen again so easily and mm -hmm. you must not let it. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a wonderful sense of closure for the people of my generation taking part and almost handing over mm -hmm. to say, you know, it's yours now, the piece is yours, look after it. I know you're passionate about mental health and wellbeing mm -hmm. and obviously your your role as a journalist and your role within the BBC, you, you saw lots of things firsthand and the fact that you're able to channel and use this, you know, for other generations is, mm -hmm. is you know, is really, really very, very admirable, Felicity. And when you talked about um, the work that you did with the Playhouse and the research and the mentoring and the support, but also the manifestation of all of these. Mm. You know, that, that's a huge, a huge, you know, um, piece of work. How, how do you sustain and nurture and nourish yourself as an artist? Mm. And how did you during those times? Or, or th were you even aware you were doing, doing anything? I think I find it very, very therapeutic, to be honest. Sharing, okay. sharing and voicing your experiences is always positive. Mm -hmm. And the feeling that you're leaving some sort of legacy you know, I mean, in the weeks before I started, it had been said to me twice, you're a piece of walking history, mm -hmm. which is a bit scary. Yes. But there maybe is some truth in it. Yes. And yes. I think another thing that set things in context for me was I was at a lovely ceremony to mark my 40th anniversary of getting my National Union of Journalists card Aww. in Dublin. Um, and there should have been so many of us there picking mm -hmm. up that card. Mm -hmm. And there were so many empty seats, people gone before their time maybe with stress, maybe with what stress had taken them mm -hmm. to. And I do feel there's a responsibility mm -hmm. for those of us that are still here to tell the story for everybody. And not just to tell the story, but to move it on. Mm -hmm. I think the first responders had been a case of, let's tell our war stories yet again. Yes. I wouldn't have been interested. Yes. But it was moving it on and it was challenging it. Uh -huh. And working with the young people was fascinating because we got so many insights into how we had normalised the abnormal and we have to rethink. I've had a bit of that, I think, with my own daughter growing up mm -hmm. because she would be one of the, another cliche, children of peace. Yes. And I remember her stopping me one day and saying, your whole geography of Ireland is skewed. Because she said, I hear a place name and I think, who do I know from there? Or we went for a drive there. Or that's a beautiful town or they have a great market. Uh -huh. And she said, you hear the geography of Northern Ireland 
I know you think is who died there, who was mm -hmm. shot there, who was buried there. But that precious and cargo. That true. Yeah, but that precious cargo that you have carried mm -hmm. for many years and actually, I suppose, shared with people at a very, mm -hmm. very significant time mm -hmm. is, you know, it's something that, that I'm sure you will, you'll always have with you. But the, the handing over and mm -hmm. the translation of that, you, you know, and how you've translated mm -hmm. it ha is, yeah. is, is very, very skilled. Felicity, very skilled indeed. Mm -hmm. Another challenge that came from one of the young people that really made me think was I was talking about one of the first jobs I did where there was a shooting and we went up the camera crew and as always there were the young kids out in the street yes. who wanted to share their experiences yes. and tell you what they'd seen and all that. And this girl who was I think about 20 said to me, why were those children out in the street? There was shooting going on. Mm -hmm. What were they doing out in the street? Mm -hmm. And that it's so simple, but it, uh -huh. it never really occurred to me. Uh -huh. And even growing up, I remember if there was anything going on, the first thing everybody did was out to the door to That's see right. what was happening. So what was your first uh, uh, published piece? My first published piece was with Guildhall Press. It was a book called Reckoning. I sent them um, two synopses and sample chapters. The one I preferred was this one, Finding Lauren, which is more of a sort of a mystery as well as a woman's story. Yes. Reckoning would be a bit more mainstream, but it was Reckoning they liked, so I put it out. And it's probably the most commercial novel I've ever done. Mm -hmm. And it went well for them, so then they let me do another one for them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. from then, things were starting to come in. And but then I was involved with Greater Chantal Awards. Yes. And was that your first? Aspects. Was that your first introduction to Ollie? Then working with Ollie Green? It would have been yes. Uh -huh. I came up here to work with youth drama with Morris Richmond, and I never really left. Uh -huh. Amelia Earhart is the other project that you've been stepped in it as was. well. We that was something that had come up for discussion. Uh huh. Um, in all these, because of course the place where Amelia landed on her ill-fated trip to Paris, her ill-fated transatlantic trip, is at Ballyarnett, just across the city, which yes. plunged us into aviation history. Uh -huh. And we realised that there was a key anniversary coming up with the landing and perhaps we should do something for it. Mm -hmm. And Ollie got together a team of which I was a small part because he knew I'd researched the history. Uh -huh. Joe Campbell, the brilliant artist. Oh, an excellent artist. Fantastic. Yes, did I the know Joe well. Novel. Yes. That went around local schools. Uh -huh. We rebranded the Golden Link Festival as the Earhart Festival. Um, people started to come forward with their memorabilia mm -hmm. of Amelia. So many people had a story to tell or a piece of the plane or whatever. Um, there was a play written by two former colleagues here one day in May that was mm -hmm. performed. We had exhibitions in the museum. Oh, and also for 2013 as part of the City of Culture celebration. still going. And yes. And there's still, when we come out of lockdown, I would hope that our council will still observe Amelia Day every day. Yes. Every year on the anniversary. And wasn't there a talk about re changing the name of the of the airport? I think the lounge is now the Amelia Earhart Lounge, the yes. VIP lounge. Yes. We have that. We still haven't got a really good memorial out at the London Strip, mm -hmm. so if anybody mm -hmm. with funding and influence is left, mm -hmm. and you never know, have to get. you never know. And of course, when we had cow parade, we had the fiberglass we had cows. Amelia. We have Amelia, uh, and we'll have a chance to see her, and she's outside mm -hmm. uh, here as well. Mm -hmm. But um, just, I'm just overwhelmed with all of the work that you've done. Um, so, what are you working on at the minute? Um, well, I've done a variety of things, you should say. I've done two young adults, which were great fun okay. for a Dublin publisher. I've done a couple that are based on miscarriages of justice, where I was writing with people. Okay. Louise Mason, a woman who had her children taken off, off her after a wrongful accusation. And this one is still going. It's a police officer who died in jail after being convicted of a murder that his family believe he didn't commit. Mm -hmm. um, this came from shared history of World War One, and this is the one that... I'm very proud of this one because it won us the Heritage Lottery Award for the UK. Yes. Best project and is still active in schools today. And we mentioned earlier about working with people who don't have a voice. I'm also very proud of this one that came up during the culture year, which you will remember. I do remember that. Working with the Haven, the drop-in centre that for people very... with abuse issues. And I suppose really it brings me back to the point we were talking about earlier about the importance of being able to express ourselves and express, you know, the good and the bad and, and the ugly mm. as well. Yeah. And you did provide an opportunity. You have already over the years 
um, a voice for those that find it really, really difficult. It was so empowering because there were people who could so easily have been excluded from the city of culture. There was a feeling, it wasn't probably totally irrational, that what some people would like them to do for the city of culture was clean up the streets and put them well out of the way and pretend I, I they don't remember, exist. I remember those conversations because I know the visual artists, they felt as well, you know, what's going to happen, you know, to yes. us emerging artists. It wasn't, ju it mm -hmm. shouldn't just be about the mm -hmm. big names. And I think in fairness, you know, being part of the team and working very closely with people like yourselves, there was an opportunity to try and celebrate the creativity in the broadest sense yeah. and the work that yourself and Ollie and so many other community groups, you know, making sure that, you know, communities had voices mm -hmm. and, and celebrated those voices as well mm -hmm. and celebrated the work that they did. Yeah, I mean, it won them some epic awards and I'm absolutely delighted. It was one of the things I'm just very, very proud of, even mm -hmm. though there's very little of me in it. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the other thing I want to say as well is that there is no doubt, and I know you share this as well, that our creativity and our self-expression is so important, particularly at this time. Oh, that's that's where our well-being comes from. Mm -hmm. Even if nobody ever sees it, even if we're writing for ourselves. Like I've kept a journal ever since lockdown started. Mm -hmm. I know there are tentative plans for libraries in Northern Ireland to gather together a lot of people who continued their journals yes, and yes. to compile them in some sort of archive for the future. Uh -huh. But I mean, that's been therapy for me, Yes, even reading back over it and seeing how how the mood has changed uh -huh. and how focused we were on it at the start and how it became part of life and the ups and downs of it. And I think another thing that's very important as when I'm at the writing bit, Theatre is so social, yes. but when I'm at the writing, but that can be a bit solitary. Well, you see, if any it's art yourself, form, yeah. yes, and, and yes. I, I know as a visual artist that you mm -hmm. have to you have to remove yourself and, and mm -hmm. create, and that can be a very mm -hmm. grueling process, a very destructive process if you're not careful, because you can be so, so self-critical, you know, mm -hmm. to the point where you're completely stopped and blocked from being creative at all. Absolutely, or you can vanish into it. Absolutely. And lose sight of the real world. That's why I think linking up with other artists has always been great. And I suppose for me, our human rights, our health and well-being has become really, really important. And I, I have been looking at things differently. Um, I, I took up early retirement there almost three years ago and I called it refirement. And I'm looking now at the, the importance of being fulfilled as opposed to being successful. I think being fulfilled is something that is much more um, healthy. It's much more um, balanced and much more nurturing. I you think know. that's what that is one of the positive things that's come out of the pandemic and lockdown for a lot of people is we really all have reassessed our priorities. What did we yes. really miss? Yes. What did we not miss? And maybe we've all taken a step back from consumerism mm -hmm. and thought, what have we really missed or what do I really want to do? Yes. And a lot of those people who had always felt they wanted to write or practice some other form mm -hmm. of creative art, they've had the time suddenly to do it. Mm -hmm. Irrespective of age or stage in life, that's yeah. the beauty. That is the beauty about mm -hmm. about being creative and being you know, having an opportunity to, to express yourself. And you've done that with so many age groups and stages. You're going to read us some of your, your I work. Will. I am back with the photos now. The largest is standing in front of me on my desk. This one I know is your pride and joy, Ginny. That would have been my granny. The family treasure, carried from hearth to hearth like the family Bible, and equally, equally disingenuous in the information it offers and the lifestyle it suggests. It's in a tarnished gilt frame set inside a black card border and stamped in gold with the insignia of the Belfast High Street studio where it was taken. Somehow the glass has survived moving around the six counties in the passage of time, three generations, unscathed. In the portrait is the fair-haired boy, a golden curl intersecting the pale sweep of his forehead, perhaps held by a touch of sugary water. He scrubbed to a perfection of cleanliness, probably achieved by the same vigorous scrubbing as Jenny's front doorstep and a good slather of carbolic soap. His chubby limbs have been forced into the starched formality of a sailor suit, complete with bow. His little back boots gleam. He is so loved. He is little Lord Fauntleroy. He is a prince regent. He is a child actor. He is a million miles from the gloomy dampness of the row. He clutches the leather reins of a splendid rocking horse, flaxen mane, embellished saddle, brasses and buckles. He stares hesitantly at the camera, the telltale signs of myopia already there. His plump little lips are open, as if to speak, to say what. And within minutes he will be back in his everyday clothes and dragged screaming out of the studio and away, away forever from this magnificent beast that he thought was his gift 
his to keep any two-year-old would protest. Outside, the papers tell of war dead and injured, and the nearer home you get, the more the streets exude that indescribable air of poverty, dump washing, stale vegetables, choked drains. But all is well, because Ginny and Maggie will soon receive the photograph posted to them in its cardboard sleeve, the indubitable proof for now and future generations that they did their best for you. The photograph must have cost a week's wages, maybe more. Never mind the luxury of the train trip to Belfast. What were you thinking of, Ginny? How much did it matter that for one brief half hour, now frozen in time, your son was what you dreamed, what you knew he could and should be? Believe me, Ginny. He was much, much more. But I've got a shoulder to keep, to cry on, to have and to hold, just to sleep and rely on. And if you just open your door, well, I know we'd have something that's precious, something pure and I'll love you little miss Blue. it's great to see you it's been a while since i've been up to studio two and i know and i hope we're emerging out of the, the third and final lockdown but um, <laughs> it's great to see you and it's great to be in in a venue that is pulsating with creativity mm -hmm. and I know that you like myself are very keen to acknowledge the importance of arts and culture not mm -hmm. just you know for festivals but all year round and particularly at this time I know we share an interest as well in mental health and well-being so so how are you getting on? Well well as ever you're very very welcome to Derry and very welcome here to Studio 2, we're at the home of Greater St. Alcan Arts. And uh, as always, I suppose, we've been very busy. Mm -hmm. And even throughout the last year and a half, nearly now, is it getting? Uh, I suppose, uh, I forget the times. Uh, during this pandemic, I think it flies back that quick. Even during that time, we haven't stopped. Mm -hmm. I think initially, uh, back in March, uh, we kicked in with uh, a free meal service to the elderly and vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. We started off with people who we thought would use our services, but then expanded right out across the community. Mm -hmm. And I suppose for us, it was really about what community arts is all about. Mm -hmm. the community element had to come very strong, mm -hmm. uh, and ensuring that we were supporting those elderly, vulnerable residents uh, from right across our city to be supported at that time of crisis was important. So mm -hmm. between that uh, beginning of March 2020 and end of June, we delivered something like 22,000 meals out to people. So that kept us busy mm -hmm. and kept us going. But also give our volunteer base a very, uh, and we had a great uh, bunch of volunteers working with us throughout mm -hmm. that time. Your volunteers are known or renowned. You know, I know from the whole City of Culture yeah. context and since then as well, Ollie, you've done great work with volunteers. They were amazing in terms of how they tied back in and ensured that uh, we would do as much as we could to help support people. Mm -hmm. So as a community arts organization, I think that's the importance of it. Mm -hmm. and it's really about the social value and of course, we're anxious now and we have kept uh, levels of our arts programming going. Mm -hmm. We had to move to the online system like everyone else. Mm -hmm. And of course it's intergenerational. That's one of the key aspects of what you do here. Mm. You know, w Without a doubt, I think supporting young people in terms of, as a community arts organisation, it's about the first step engagement, mm -hmm. encouraging participatory arts, people coming in, trying out things for the first time. And sometimes even older people are trying for the first time. Mm -hmm. But I think that intergenerational attitude to where we're delivering, we're here to create a shared space, a mm -hmm. space that's shared by all generations and people from all communities, and using, I suppose, the ability of the arts to actually allow for cultural creative expression, mm -hmm. but also in terms of the social side of it, ensuring that people come along here, they feel they're in a place they like, mm -hmm. they're in a place that uh, welcomes them, mm -hmm. they're in a place where skills can uh, be developed, they're in a place where they can meet new friends, and we see that especially our youngsters, mm -hmm. but also with the older people, you know, the isolation that can happen uh, is very clear. So having the opportunity for people to come sometimes try out something within the arts mm -hmm. and meet new friends, have a laugh, mm -hmm. I think. Laughter and fun is the most important mm -hmm. element of, I think, self-health mm -hmm. uh, for people. Mm -hmm. um, 
our older people's and our mental health and well-being programs are very important, but they're very key to actually going beyond, I suppose, what the arts can deliver, but also supporting the fact that that creative engagement, that creative opportunity for them to try out different things, to meet sometimes the peer programs that are run are the most important. Yeah. They're meeting with other people, they're sharing their stories, sharing their experiences, and I think that has been a key element that we have learned, mm -hmm. I think, during the course of this pandemic. The most important part of that was that key element of support that they received. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were talking to Felicity there about mm -hmm. her, her uh, work and her experiences, both as a journalist and also as a facilitator as well. And I know that the whole Amelia Earhart is something that you have with great pride built and developed mm -hmm. here as well and and uh, I see the the Amelia Earhart cow is out there yeah. <laughs> as a major a major I think piece. I, I suppose we've been delighted over many years to have such wonderful access to such wonderful for arts facilitators to come and work with us Felicity mm -hmm. I've known for over 20 years she now was in terms me that. of this uh -huh. and for me I think one of the real joys in terms of working with Felicity was our, from our very early projects when we done the Agnes Jones story yes Felicity came in and showed me a photograph of an overgrown grave in Fawn which ended up sparking uh, a play uh, and about the history of Agnes Jones, mm -hmm. a pioneer, pioneer nurse mm -hmm. uh, who had been kind of near enough forgotten in her city. Yes. That expanded and they also doing a documentary drama for television that had a cast of over 200, involved people like Bruna Geiger That's and right. Dan Gordon and others. That's right. Screened in ATV and on New Zealand and in Australia, places like that. We ended up bunching on, publishing a book that Felicity has written uh -huh. about it. Uh-huh, we and saw it, we actually saw we, it. But we also... Uh, Created uh, in Key Stage 3 in History, actually put it into the curriculum and stuff like that as well. So I suppose it's a creative project that began mm -hmm. with the idea uh, with people coming together, mm -hmm. looking at the opportunity for putting on a play mm -hmm. and seeing just where that expanded to. Very important piece of local history that mm -hmm. can be best told uh, through the arts. And of course, Ali, I mean, I know you many years mm. and I know the, your, your own personal passion and commitment to this work, but also, you know, the visibility of what you do at a community level is very, very significant as well and not just for 2013 but subsequently whether there's a festival mm. or there's opportunities to celebrate this city or this region you have mm. had and built a huge um, crew of volunteers who are very very loyal and also impacted on not just their learning but also mm. on their career paths as well. I think so and I think you've seen people progress from volunteers and the staff and to yes. you know, facilitators and people have gone on to all kinds of different processes. I remember doing the likes of Talent Northwest, for example. Oh, it seen, was excellent. You've seen the progression of people coming from their first stage uh, doing auditions yes. right through the performing. And I look around like so we Amy Meenan now mm -hmm. appearing in the London Palladium and playing in different gigs all over the world. You know, I think it's important to watch uh, and support people's progression mm -hmm. but at the same time I think in terms of us very clearly as a community arts organisation we're here to service and encourage as many people over mm -hmm. the door as possible. Mm -hmm. On average before we went into lockdown we would have had around 13 to 1400 people a week coming through and we have 80 to 90 classes a week we have projects and festivals and events to run and I think we're looking forward to the time when we come out of lockdown mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to be even more I mm -hmm. think we've created new facilities here and areas such as this you're in Gallia. Yeah. You're in an area that has high social economic deprivation among the top 5% in mm -hmm. the UK. Mm -hmm. A lot of social issues, mm -hmm. a lot of issues that we're the only full time arts centre, you know, in this area. Mm -hmm. Service in the population now of the area of nearly 50,000 people. And that's unbelievable. And when you, when you come in, and I'm reminded again of the facilities, and you talk there about, you know, people coming to a place that they feel that, first of all, that they're welcomed, that, they're, that uh, there's a beautiful ambience about the place and and also that it's it's actually top notch in terms of you know that that they are valued and the arts are valued here and creativity is valued it's very very evident from from what you have and from the illustrations and the images and of course I'm familiar with your your annual reports but I'm also familiar too of the work and your commitment at a at a regional level as well we talked about the program for government the draft mm -hmm. program for government the consultation of the mental health strategy and i know that you too have responded as well as as i have um, and encourage others to do the same because if we don't respond to these opportunities and consultations mm. things will remain the same and we've got to step up in terms of our own mental health and well-being yeah i think that's key that's key uh -huh. influencing the program of government from community arts perspective and from all arts perspectives yes. is important. The social value of the arts, I think, for a long time has been underestimated. Mm -hmm. And yes, 
we have taken two old garages and turned them into an art centre in the heart mm -hmm. of an area. Uh, and in terms of investment, it's very difficult to get investment. You know, yes. we're probably at the lower levels of investment when it comes to support of the arts, community arts. Mm -hmm. But what I would say is this, the value and the social value of what we do, I think is starting to get recognised. Mm -hmm. I think we need very clearly, and I've had conversations in the last number of weeks, mm -hmm. you know, with the Chair of the Arts Council, with the Minister for Department of Communities, mm -hmm. uh, with the Education Minister, talking about the real social value of community arts and the engagement in yeah. that. And, and also re respect and acknowledgement across government departments, that, yeah. that this is not just about being art, arts related, it's about health and well-being, it's about our economy, it's about health and well-being, it's, it's you know, the, the dividends, mm. the positive think, dividends you know, are obvious. Well, it's clearly for us, it's also about saving lives. Yeah. And in terms of engaging people at a range of times in their lives, some young, some older, engage them in the value of the arts mm -hmm. that actually, what does it do? We know what the arts does. It raises self-esteem. It builds confidence. Mm -hmm. It creates social opportunities. It creates opportunity for expression. It tell, lets people tell their stories. And sometimes that's all people want to do. Mm -hmm. So through the arts stream, it's many different formats. It allows people to tell their stories at times. And the dark, and the, yeah, and the darker stories as well mm -hmm. as the lighter stories are very important. And we, we heard from Felicity about you know, those conversations and how important they are. And I think, I think what you're doing, um, Ollie, with your facilitators and with your staff and your volunteers is very, very precious work. Mm. And I think, particularly coming out of lockdown and this pandemic, there are a whole range of other issues that may manifest themselves mm. in terms of our mental health and wellbeing. But for me, it's obvious, creativity and self-expression mm. is very important. People are, I think, they have been closeted and isolated for a long time now. Mm. I think the role that the arts have to play in the time ahead is vital. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be supported by every government department, not just the Arts Council, yes. not just in terms of the Department for Communities, not just the Health Department, Education Department, Enterprise and others. We need all them coming together to see the real social value of the arts, understanding the key intervention that community arts in particular can mm -hmm. make mm -hmm. in terms of engaging people, in terms of uplifting their spirits. Mm -hmm. But I say most importantly, I've seen this directly with some of our people who were talking about the social prescribing process. Yes. And very clearly the social prescribing of engagement in the arts can has a 10 times better effect than actually hand anyone a prescription. Absolutely. And I think and that process, it's cheaper, it's more valuable, and it's longer term, it will have better results. And more sustainable. And more sustainable. You know, and I think that's the important sometimes that people have to date, maybe not really valued, Mm -hmm. uh, the contribution of community arts it has always been, I think, at maybe at the lower end of, of the art form. Yes. But I think now there's a growing understanding and I hope that we can encourage that because it's there to be seen. Mm -hmm. It's there. I've heard it directly from those at a very low ebb and have talked about how uh, the arts in terms of engagement and it's the social engagement mm -hmm. as well as the art forms. Mm -hmm. The creativity creates the opportunity for a voice. Mm -hmm. And when people are heard and people can give the confidence to express themselves, and that's the start of curing. That's the start of actually being able to cure some of the illnesses that have affected people. Mm -hmm. Be that from depression, be that from recovery, be that from the opportunity of uh, dealing with isolation of, uh, and loneliness that this pandemic has caused. So mm -hmm. hopefully that will give and a way forward. Uh, Ollie, I have known you many, many years mm. and you are still as, as passionate about what you do now as you were then. And I suppose what I want to end up with is talking about the the pathway through from recovery to discovery. This is something that you are particularly passionate about in relation yeah. to the role that you are playing here mm -hmm. as, a, as a community arts organisation. I think it's key. We've been working on a consultation process for the last year and a half. We've uh -huh. done a series of pilot programmes. Uh, we're developing up uh, a bid. We've obviously made submissions to the mental health strategy and the health strategy. Yes. Uh, and the programme for government. I think recovery discovery has at its core the opportunity for social prescribing community arts as a way of engaging people at their lowest ebb in terms of health, mm -hmm. engaging them in the arts mm -hmm. uh, as a pathway to their own health, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. a pathway to recovery, as a pathway to a better feeling about themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key. Yeah. We've and without a, without a dependence on on prescription you know, drugs well, as well. I mean, we understand the social value of this will be in yeah. terms of that, but we also the economic value. And we have made these cases now to the Department of Health. We're making these cases to doctors, their own surgeries right across the city and the region. We're making the argument for social prescribing of community arts as a better alternative mm 
mm-hmm. to a prescription. Mm-hmm. As a better alternative to suggesting that people are going to serious counselling. I think the peer support that people can get through community arts and engagement in it in all its forms. Mm-hmm. It's the storytelling processes I think is key. Mm-hmm. The listening processes that we have seen happening with our older people who are in recovery and with younger people who are dealing with a wide range of different issues. And some, some, from the same fa- some from the same families, from, which is ironic. You, you know, know, more so I suppose, and we can only speak from an area that has already suffered from the highest levels of social economic deprivation mm-hmm. and ill health. And I think and in a community such as this, it is vital, but it's vital in all our communities. Mm-hmm. I think coming out of this pandemic, we know the tsunami mm-hmm. uh, of mental health issues Absolutely. that are coming at us. Yes. So how are we going to address it? Our pathway in terms of supporting this uh, in recovery to discovery is to provide places where people can come. We want them certainly take referrals from surgeries, from doctors, from psychiatrists, from all social services. But I think that's key for us. Uh, a key, I think, for lots of our mm-hmm. organisations that we can play and be that valuable contributor to our community's recovery and health. Mm-hmm. Well, continued success, Ollie, and thank you so much. I'm looking forward to getting back up into the city and to the live gigs, and I know the Jazz Festival is mm-hmm. coming soon as well. But um, I hope you continue to create and to connect and to inspire. Ollie, thank you very, very thank much. You. Thank you. Love you, little man. I was really looking forward to coming here and I know that this is your studio that you have basically been using. You know, it'll be a studio in your own home, but this is one that that Ollie Green has given you to to work with and work from. Yep, Uh, Ollie actually gave me the studio a few years ago and it's just been great. Like, you know, I mean, they they have that space and the separation from the home Uh because I I have a paint at home, but but, uh, there's nothing like... uh, it's almost like a job then when you come down here because you're yes. just detached from, from the home. And I'm sure everybody in the home too isn't complaining of the, the, the smell of the spirits and everything uh-huh. like that. So, so down here's been great. And like I say, uh, the support I get from Ollie and Studio 2, and it's just been brilliant. Like, you know, and it, it's actually given me a, a chance to actually uh, use this as a space to, to, to teach people as well. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, mm-hmm. uh, I've got the space to teach people. And uh, well, you know we've been using this now for for a good three three four years, like, and it's mm-hmm. been great. And well, I know you now. I think since just before twenty thirteen, and I know you on a number of levels. I know you as a very uh, talented artist who's very very passionate about the arts and creativity, and also somebody who has a huge heart and a huge um, interest in supporting your your community and people who are interested in the arts in general. And we we had a conversation about um, Ken Robinson, yep. because you, you heard Ken Robinson speak and he's, he's, he's been someone who has inspired both of us over the years. In the City, city Hotel he spoke about um, finding your passion and about creativity and all of that. And you have followed that. You're basically living the dream in the sense of somebody who is an educator. You facilitate workshops and, and classes for all age groups. You've been a, a, a part-time lecturer as well as down in, in Manor College or Southwest Regional College as well in, in a skill. And, um, and I recognise this character because I know uh. <laughs> that you had, um, I opened your first solo exhibition as part of 2013. And I know this, this man, Brian, is, was a very close friend that you did a piece and presented to his family. Yep, yep, uh, well. we, we, Brian, I, uh, like I say, I would... Uh, uh, he was a wee character, as you could see, and I really enjoyed the paint anybody that uh, sometimes you'll, you'll meet a certain person and you just need to paint them. Brian was, was definitely one of them. And, and uh, I think when you mentioned Ken there as well, like that idea of uh, just the idea of uh, playing again, this idea of uh, creativity. It's so important that uh, when, you know, this is what happens down here whenever we're working, is the idea that people can come in as adults and they get so such a relief from the idea that uh, you know they can create 
and uh, I think that's a big, uh, uh, something that I would stress a lot, that even with working with the mental health and stuff, is that idea of creating that's really important and having that opportunity to create. And uh, they create, and we were chatting about this before too, that just in the society we live in at the minute, that's just uh, unput, unput, you know, all the time, and there's no output, and that, that imbalance where you're not creating is something that needs to be addressed. And uh, I think especially in schools, you know, as well, which are more left-brained, <laughs> there needs to be an injection of right brain and, and creativity, just like Ken would say. And I think that's what I enjoy down here is the idea that, that you get people on and uh, they surprise themselves, mm -hmm. you know. And, that's and they're what always we're doing. becoming childlike and curious again, which is really important. Yep. You know? And we were talking there because I know that you exhibited with us in the London Street Gallery as part of 2013 yep. as well. And you would, would have been very generous with your time in supporting us, you know, and supporting other artists as well. And I, I still have the poster of um, the final exhibition that we had um, in the, the London Street Gallery and we used a, a piece by you which was just a stunning piece of this little girl in a red coat that was full of vibrance and energy and then the backdrop of the cityscape that was imaginary and, and you, you know, reimagined. Yep, yep. yep. That, 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 uh, that's actually, like I say, it was uh, even uh, the idea that you had this wee innocence and, 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 and like you had this essence against the backdrop of maybe these... Uh, you know, buildings at uh, and rough sort of areas. <laughs> they were all patched together, and uh -huh. and uh, you know, I think uh, they have that we that we uh, figure then a wee small figure of hope, and that, that that I think that that's even come up for me again mm -hmm. from that of trying to uh, they try and uh, actually revisit, you know, the topic of uh, that 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 small light and the darkness mm -hmm. and the and the against bigger backdrops. And I think there's no, with the time we're having at the moment with this, it's a pretty, you know, it's with the, the, the likes of the COVID, you know, COVID mm -hmm. and stuff like that. It's, it's, it, you know, it's given me a chance to sit down and think, uh, and I think it's important for a lot of artists to think about what, what is it that lights you up? What is it that you really yes. want to say? And I mean, even with some work that I've been working with this last while, uh, you know, it, it wasn't lighting me up and it seemed to, it seemed to have just went away. So th this time, uh, you know, time where I wasn't working and that I could sit by myself and, and actually, you know, right out, what is it you want to do? Uh -huh. It's been really valuable to, to me myself because when things open up now, you know, again, uh, you know, I can see myself just uh, uh, more or less helping others as well. The idea of play again, that's, uh, that's so important, you know, and, and it was... Like I say, in that time off, mm -hmm. it was good to discover, go back to what he enjoyed doing. That's what I, I was doing. I know, you and know. Reflect, re reflect on what you've done, because you were explaining to me as well, Tommy, um, because I know that you, pl you plan to have you know, a number of exhibitions and touring shows and all of that, and you had planned as well, it, it, with the States as well, you had planned to, to exhibit as well in the States. And you were saying as well that in revisiting your work and looking at it with a sense of um, kind of new kind of found curiosity, that your style has changed and emerged, you know. So, so will we expect your work to look very different? Uh, yeah, but parts of it are going to be a lot different. I think that, uh, you know, there's this idea that it's important to me that there's a balance you need to have between, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, technical aspects of your craft and learning that and then uh, that comes with expectations as well because you're trying to sometimes do stuff a certain way because you're maybe painting for the audience and I found that myself and, and but there's a whole other aspect of playing and exploration and mm -hmm. the real creativity the stuff and that needs to come back on and I think that I say this last while has been great because of that you've been uh, doing a I was telling you doing a three month intensive course and it's been really helping me just connect again with that that play and you can play and then you can go and solve stuff tactically but get back to play and it, it's a wee yes. sort of dance until you get that equilibrium uh -huh. between that uh, again the right brain the left brain you know and uh it's funny now you look at some of the work even you know maybe even something like that you know the, yes. the black and the white and you have to be in the middle uh -huh. and you know that stuff comes on now you start to you know so that that's basically what it's uh you know been about for me is trying to get that that equilibrium between you know sort of uh, and going back to the past was important yes. you know and seeing because there yes. was something about past work that that I had and uh, I think sometimes you need to 
go back and uh, forward sometimes. You, uh -huh. you, you do and, either. And, and, and it is, I suppose, a way of building block because if your foundation isn't strong, well, then it'll all topple down. So to have this space beyond your own home is very, very healthy to yep. you, isn't it? It's good, so it keeps that separation and, and uh, you know, Although I, I, I would talk about the discipline, I've definitely, you know, and that's something I'm addressing as well, because it's so easy, you know, just they, uh, they sort of uh, slip up sometimes, and it, but it's so easy to pick it up again, and I think it's just about being consistent and, and stuff, and, uh, and like, again, everybody's always learning, and like I was, uh, funny, I was reading a book there, and uh, in the book, it was, uh, uh, it was a book I'd recommend to anyone, The, the War on Art. He, he said, uh, Leo Tolstoy wrote uh, War and Peace and he had 13 kids. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you, he, you he can find that. He obviously you, took a break. You can find <laughs> the hour, you know, or the few hours, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, the, there is that time, you know, but again, it's discipline. And, and I'm only, um, like I say, I'm trying myself now as well, you know, and I'm hoping now that, especially coming out of this, I can see a big change in what I'll be doing and, and that. so I'm looking forward to it. So how have you nourished and nurtured yourself during during lockdown? Well, I, I, again, I'd, I'd looked at it as, you know, an opportunity because I had so much time uh -huh. that, uh, you know, that I, I had to sit down and really think, like, what what is it? There was something wrong, you know, I'm not uh, going to lie, when I was producing the work that I was producing, it wasn't resonating. Uh -huh. and, uh, Again, it was uh, the idea just going back, going, oh, what, what was it that lit you up in the first place? Mm -hmm. What was it you enjoyed? You know, you, you can go and I've done it with, uh, you know, especially this last few weeks, you can go and you can, you know, you can write down what is it, what, you know, like almost like a wee spider diagram and yes. go, go back and, yeah. and, and you'll find then eventually with a wee bit of discovery, what is it that got you? You know, and they just, what was it that, that sort of, uh, you know, that you, why was it you wanted to create in the first place? Whether it's writing, whether it's, it's, uh, it's painting, you know, it's, it could be anything. All the arts are the, the same in my book, you know. And, and, uh, and you're an you know, avid lover of music as well. So, you, so the, all of the art forms can influence us in, in what we do or what we experience as well. Yep, a hundred, a hundred percent. Like, I mean, uh, you know, uh, just... Uh, Talking with anybody that's uh, doing that, that's done art, or any artist, they'll all tell you they go through these phases where you do have a block, and mm -hmm. you know, and again, uh, this was a good time for me to, to sit down and to really be honest with myself and what 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 was blocking uh, my own sort of journey because uh, and uh, it's funny I'm painting the hero's journey and and that's all part of it is going under the and you that's know a theme, that's you a theme know that you've you've been um, working with for a while because I, I know I, I yeah. always associate that with you yeah but uh -huh. I, I, and I mean there's big parts of it where you know the the the, the actual uh, you have to go under the deeper stuff uh -huh. to come out eventually with with uh, you know with something you can something special that you could maybe help others with and stuff so that that that's all psychological but it's mm -hmm. it's really interesting. Uh -huh. that, and uh, like I say, so this whole time now I've, I've uh, been working, uh, studying, doing courses and recently started practicing, uh, working with play again. Yes. More play was really important because there's only so much technical stuff you can be doing before you, you know, there was a lack and, and I'm glad that that gave me a, a chance. So I'm looking forward to the, a chance to just actually to address that and to get more of a balance now. And, uh, and I'm looking forward, like I said, it'll not be long that things open up again. And actually, it's another thing you can help people with, you know, yes. because I find that's that's everyone gets stuck at some stage with with one aspect. And I think it could be more the play aspect. That's the hardest thing. Play, uh, get back to what you enjoy doing as a child or and, and that's the key, you know. I suppose what always has struck me with your work is the energy that those little characters or, or, or children play in your pieces. And I'm thinking of the last exhibition we had, which was Beyond What's Possible, beyond, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the idea of the, the end of 2013, beyond the, the walls of any gallery. And I'm reminded as well that you, any of the characters or the children that you're involved in, you know, as, as the players in some of your paintings, you invited them to the launches of your exhibitions. And that was just beautiful to witness uh, because you don't uh, normally see that. You don't normally see children at exhibition launches. It's normally, you know, adults and, you know, it can be quite stuffy. But I think this idea about re-energising what we're doing and the way we work is a very healthy thing. Uh, you know? they, they, I think there's a lot of, lot of inspiration to, to be had in your own, you know, really 
community and what's you know you can see it all the time like i say that's that idea that you don't you know you don't need to look far to, to, to see stuff sometimes if you're just uh you know uh, we chat about this just being grateful and stuff you're you, you know you be on that you can pick up and stuff yes. you know yes. but you know and uh i just uh like i say i'm be revisiting my own work now and more human type stuff uh -huh. I, I think i went away off on the fantasy for a while uh -huh. and it's not working so it's bringing it back on the what it, what, what it worked at you know uh and, and for yet, me and yet tommy i would always say that you're always intrigued by the human condition and how fragile and resilient it is and again this while it was one of your small, the small the earlier uh, pieces uh, has that there's an authenticity with it yeah. there's a connection and a sense of space and place but also this human spirit you know yeah, nah. and i know that you seek out faces and portraits of people that you feel you know there's a, a sense of connection with and it shows in your work you uh, know and i can see thanks. i can see and i'm looking forward to seeing the next body of work and celebrating this exhibition because i know we hope to have it, to hope to see it on tour yeah, that's Tommy, great. thank you so Talk much mere. thanks very much thanks yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well you fool them all with your games and you're right but I've got a shoulder to keep, to cry on, to have and to hold, just to sleep and to lie on. And if you just open your door, well, I know we'd have something that's precious, something pure, and I'll love you. to see you thank you very much and well. it's great to be here in your studio the last time i was here it was before lockdown i think it was in between lockdown yeah yeah, yeah. and I, I just I mean so many of your pieces i know that you have been putting them up online as well and the piece that you're working on at the minute is a piece uh it's called uh, the the chieftain's walk because uh, we can't go or what well, the stage was walk across the border uh -huh. and keep it uh, between Derry and Donegal uh, that was a favourite route, uh, going up the back roads towards Greenan, mm -hmm. and uh, it was called the Chieftain's Walk, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it gave me some kind of inspiration and something to look forward to uh, in the future whenever lockdown is over. Mm -hmm. And Barry, I know that you are very passionate and continue to be very passionate about the arts, mm -hmm. and I know as a as a now retired art and design teacher, yeah. you are certainly not retired as an artist because you. You're, the level of productivity and the level of work that you've been doing, not just over this last number of years, but throughout lockdown, I'm just reminded of some of the beautiful pieces and very poignant pieces, you know, are very powerful. And yeah. I know that these are, are pieces that we're familiar with. And this idea of, you know, the loss of connection with family and loved ones. Yes. And yet you have remained connected and connecting people in the work that you do. And I'm just looking at all of the work around here whether it's local scenes or local people or celebrating champions that have been part and parcel of, you know, the frontline services, you know, they've been really, really um, very, very emotionally charged pieces, you well, know. This one in particular, uh, it was of a nurse who had done a 13 hour shift. And uh, whenever she came back home, I think it's around Feeney, that direction, mm -hmm. uh, she saw a lot of kids out. Uh, carrying on and uh, they weren't wearing masks and uh, she f was worried about them coming back home and, and bringing the COVID into the house mm -hmm. and uh, as a, f a form of protest I suppose more than anything else she uh, took a photograph of herself with the mask off and this is how I, uh, my representation of her mm -hmm. uh, during that time. And it was always like her face is scarred because I know you've done, you've, you've, you've created a number of heroes represented in so many different ways yeah. with the scars visibly yeah. there when the masks are removed. And I also know too, Barry, you've been extremely generous because you have gifted a number of these pieces to the people that you painted or that you recorded and also to um, the, the hospital, Alta Galvin Hospital. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it started off... Uh, the night of the first cl uh, clapping at eight o'clock mm -hmm. and I did a picture of a nurse standing at the door and I thought well, maybe I should do a bit more than that and, uh -huh. and uh, some of uh, my friends and their families have daughters who are nurses mm -hmm. so uh, I put a post on Facebook that says uh, uh, if you would like to get your picture done uh, give me a shout 
So I, I let it go and I came back to it at about 10 o'clock and there were seven. Uh -huh. <laughs> I thought we were, I would get one or two. Yes. But I thought I've offered it, so uh -huh. I'm going to finish. But uh, uh, handing over the print, print or the picture to the, the, the family member, they, they were really chuffed. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, some of their daughters would be maybe in Liverpool or in Manchester or running a COVID ward. Uh -huh. And I thought that uh, connectedness for them uh -huh. now, the, and they were so proud of their daughters. It's almost like a love letter of it sorts. Is, oh, yeah. You know, and, a love letter of sorts. And uh, I, I, there were uh, cleaners, the, the local postman, and I just stopped them in the street and I said, you're doing a great job. And he goes, mm -hmm. oh, thanks very much. I said, but I want to do your picture. I just want to say thanks for being there. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, <laughs> I think it was about three or four months later, he arrived back. Uh, Where's my patent? <laughs> <laughs> I said I got lost in the post. Oh, <laughs> well, I give it to him. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, but uh, oh no, th those are very personal stories as well, and I know that it makes us think a lot about our parents, particularly those that have, well, yeah, have passed yeah. on. You know, and you did a lovely piece as well, and it was your your late mother. Yeah. And it was like, a, did you call it? Was it the visitation? Uh, the visitation. It was. Uh, uh, my, my, my sister Sharon, who was always there for my mother, uh -huh. and uh, sometimes in the home, uh, uh, the girls uh, would be in their PPE gear and would make a fuss of her, but sometimes she'd drop off to sleep mm -hmm. in the chair. And uh, the thing is, the hands of the nurse was Sharon. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, there was that bond between uh, a mother and daughter, uh -huh. it was just tremendous. It was you just know. beautiful. Yeah. It was beautiful. And I think a lot of people have been grieving during this time, but, yeah. but art has been a huge salve. And I suppose we were talking earlier to you, Barry, and I know, I know that you have mentored and supported and inspired so many young people, so many generations of of um artists and musicians and singer songwriters and we're speaking to john Derry and, and <laughs> Mark, i know that you, matt, you, you taught uh, matt Derry. he's a very very accomplished musician as well as actor too you yeah, know yeah and uh, uh, i took him for art and he did the move and image work as well and there were, he just had that spontaneity and joy and mm -hmm. what he was doing mm -hmm. and uh, that's something that can't be taught mm -hmm. he just he just uh, um, uh immersed himself in his uh -huh. work well, it was funny because I, I have witnessed first ha hand by being in your classroom, seeing you um, support and inspire young, young, young boys when you were, you know, when was, I'm thinking particularly of um, St. Joseph's and almost like, they were like grown men, but they, you, they were like putty in your hand because they were so, so interested in what you were doing and you had huge empathy for them as well and also the portraits that they did, that, that you had got them to do these like, like portraits that were larger than life, almost yeah, well, the size of those windows. And yeah. we, had a, we had a lovely exhibition yeah. um, in the lead up to 2013, I remember as well, yeah. down in the, in the culture office. Yeah, yeah. And it was just it was just brilliant to witness. Well, uh, those young fellas, they were willing to give me a chance. Mm -hmm. And the, the respect was mutual. But those experiences, you know, bringing youngsters to new places that aren't a million miles away you know well, but then again too there, there's that element of uh that this is something that you can take with you uh -huh. and uh uh uh, uh, uh Seney, in one of his poems i don't know whether it was a golden bow or whatever but it was just uh uh peace is the aim of art mm -hmm. and i think uh, you resolve a lot of issues but at the end of the day you put it down and you go away content Mm -hmm. And uh, that involvement and that uh, loss of um, time is fantastic. In my 30 years of teaching, I never had a clock on the wall. Mm -hmm. and I, never, I don't have one here in the gallery. Mm -hmm. It's that complete immersion in what you're doing mm -hmm. and involvement. It, it's liberating mm -hmm. and it, it does help, help your mental health. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that. And even when you were talking there about... Um, this timelessness and being absorbed and and also you know looking at, you know being so absorbed in something that you enjoy and that you're passionate about but then creating these beautiful masterpieces that you probably don't give yourself credit for and in the process are solving other you know Resolving concerns or issues, challenges yeah. in and, your head and and and, and it, it allows you that opportunity to open up that side of the brain that or subconscious or whatever and uh 
maybe delve into stuff that you hadn't dealt with. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it, once the piece of work is done, I always feel that's it. I can move on to to, some, to something uh -huh. else. And maybe the uh, the the work is prolific because I want to impart as much as I can, as quickly as I can. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a case of have I enough canvases or boards, and especially during lockdown, I was thinking about cutting up bits of furniture. <laughs> but you also had a major commission as well that you did as well during yeah. lockdown for the the new Gardaí station. Uh, well, it was uh, the uh, the four main chefs from the four main hotels in Donegal town mm -hmm. uh, got together and uh, wanted to uh, produce food for the vulnerable and the lonely mm -hmm. and the elderly around Donegal and the whole environment. So uh, the guards along with the, the, the fire service and the ambulance service mm -hmm. uh, uh, delivered 16,000 meals over maybe a three or four month period. Mm -hmm. And that was all down to the, to the work of those shell, uh, uh, the chefs and the volunteers, mm -hmm. and it was absolutely tremendous. So you created this fabulous, and I saw it. You know, this it, it's it's not a mural. It's it's a beautiful piece that is now hanging in the the, the brand new um, Gardaí station oh, right. that celebrates the collaboration between the chefs and the the, the, the Gardaí guard, and the volunteers. Volunteers, they were uh, it was absolutely uh, tremendous, and uh, be th that uh, whole idea of being part of the community mm -hmm. and living in the community and given it, the selflessness was tremendous. Mm -hmm. What do you think you've learnt from lockdown that about your own health and your own mental th health and well-being? That it's, uh, that it's okay to be alone. Okay, we have a, 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 we have a family and we have to look out for Big Michael who's got uh, extreme special needs. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, the journey you can take within the art uh, is a great form of escape, enjoyment, and sense of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. That uh, it's okay to be vulnerable in the sense of, oh, I wish I could do this and can't do that. But if you if you are in lockdown, realizing that everybody else is in the same situation, mm -hmm. which for especially the young has been very very hard for them to uh -huh. do, and uh, I I think uh, I was getting wee messages from uh, ex students. Um, about brushes and paints and stuff and, and materials and how do you do this and I thought that's great you are taking responsibility for this time and you're making it uh, something very worthwhile mm -hmm. and it, 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 it's a blessing mm -hmm. and although it, there's going to be a return to uh, normal it's going to be a new normal and I think a more caring one. Barry, thank you so much. May you continue to make your mark. You've inspired us all. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to the next live exhibition where we can go and have a glass of wine and stand a in a gallery, or a pint of Guinness in your case. And um, just just thank you. Thank you very much, Noel. Thank you for joining us in this beautiful city of culture among artists and friends. There are so many more. Our creativity and self-expression has never been more important as it is now. Embrace the arts. It's good for the heart, the mind and the soul. Continue to invest in your own creativity and look after your own mental health and well-being.